Hello and welcome to Read with Ronald. Today we'll be reading the fourth book in the Lost Fleet series, which is Valiant. If you would like to know how I got into reading this series and why I'm reading it, be sure to check out my introduction to the Lost Fleet video. I want to thank you for tuning in and I want to give you a spoiler warning to let you know that we're going to be going over the whole plot of this book. So if you don't want to be spoiled, thank you for watching up to this point, but feel free to turn the video off. If you decide to see whether you agree or disagree with what I have to say on it, feel free to come back and watch. Today is October 23rd and just really quickly, I'm about to start reading Valiant today. So I'm excited to see how it's gonna go. I hope that this book goes better than Courageous did because Courageous could have been better in my opinion. So I'm hoping that Valiant will be a better experience, but we'll see. Valiant starts with them returning to Lakota to go fight. In Jump Space, they've made some repairs to their ships. They've gotten themselves back to somewhat of a fighting capability, right? So as they're on their way to Lakota, we get some information about Geary, like how, you know, he didn't have any prior combat experience prior to like his big battle in Grendel. Everything that he knows, he learned in training and just from observing the people above him. And he only had one battle, which was that battle that ended up with him in cryosleep for a hundred years. Today is October 25th. We learned some new facts about Geary. Like, first of all, the battle where he did his big thing that he did, apparently that was his first battle like ever. Geary really don't have no combat experience and he's commanding the fleet just based off seniority. And I'm like, Geary is really good at this because for him to have basically no combat experience and be able to bring the fleet this far you're you doing a really good job to only have like one actual battle experience and so as they're getting ready to make it into Lakota Ryan she talks to Geary she's concerned that the fleet is turning into a cult and they are propping up Geary as their figurehead and she's like why are we returning to Lakota and Geary's like because just made the jump and the syndics are going to be pursuing us so if we jump back that's going to give us at least a little bit of time to get back to Lakota and, you know, figure out what we're going to do before they come after us. To build morale amongst the fleet and to give them time to actually make the repairs to their ships. She gets on the topic of Dejani because she's caught feelings for Geary. She's jealous. And they do this a lot in this book. Dejani and Ryan are going back and forth over Geary, but neither one of them are in a relationship with him. And in Dejani's case, she can't be in a relationship with him. But... We got this whole love triangle between them. And it's not really a love triangle because ain't nobody in a relationship. They get back to Lakota and they discover a bunch of damaged Syndic ships being repaired. They discovered an unguarded hypernet. It's like, it looks like a battle just took place, right? And the majority of the Syndic pursuit fleet is in jump space going after them. And they just got back. So Gary, Dejani, and Ryan, they had this plan. Take the Syndic repair ships and raid them for their supplies. Fight what's there right now to give them a head start against the pursuit fleet that's eventually going to come back. And they also find Audacious, one of the ships that stayed behind to make sure they could get out. It's a wreck and some of the crew has been taken prisoner. They come up with this plan to rescue the crew of Audacious. Gary, you know, he's like, oh, I can't do it all. So he delegates some responsibilities to Dejani. So they work together to come up with a plan. Once they come up with this plan, you know, it starts coming together. It looks great. And with the remainder of the syndics that are there, they realize the fleet's there and they start, you know, going into action to defend the repair ships and defend the hypernet. Would y'all believe it took me three days to read the first chapter? They've gone back to Lakota. They're getting ready to fight. At this point in the series, we know what to expect. It'd be the same old stuff every book. What makes each book good? is how they handle the same old same old. Courageous didn't do the best with it, but it still did a decent job. Fearless and Dauntless, they did amazing jobs with it. So I'm hoping Valiant does an amazing job too. I really don't want the series to fall off, especially because I plan on reading all the books in the series. It's an hour and a half until combat. Gary's plan is to get the supplies first, get the prisoners second, and then along the way, take out some of the ships that are there so they can have an advantage against the pursuit force when it returns because they already outnumber what's there. So they're like, we have this temporary advantage. We need to take advantage of it. And Dejani's like, oh, well, you know, 3D, which as we know is the third battleship division, which be doing the most. They are the main opposition to Geary in the fleet. They're basically the worst of the worst amongst the ships in the fleet. And they have proved themselves over and over again to be amongst the worst of the worst when it comes to being commanders. And so because their ships are so badly damaged, they haven't been making the repairs to their ships like everybody else has. Because it is, Geary puts them in charge of guarding the auxiliaries because they can't fight to their full capability because they're still badly damaged. And so Dejani's like, oh, well, you know, they might not like that. They might avoid combat because, you know, they're scary and stuff like that. And because they're not seeing any real fighting, they might avoid 
doing their duty at defending the auxiliaries. And so Geary, you know, he asks Ryan her advice on the situation. She's like, you need to treat rescuing the prisoners like it's an honor, because it is. And so because it's an honor, he puts Captain Cressida in charge of rescuing the prisoners, because, you know, she did that outstanding job back in, I think it was San Sir, where she was basically the diversion and she did an amazing job with it. So he trusts her to do an amazing job with this. He basically tries to dress it up for her, but she knows what it is. She's like, we basically not gonna see combat. I get it. I understand what's going on. And you know what, Captain? It's an honor to be able to do this. And just in case I don't make it, I got somebody waiting for me in the afterlife. And so as they're doing this, they notice the Syndic repair ship. Crews have left them instead of like staying on to fight just in case. Dejani and Geary find this strange and the reason why is because the people on the ships, they're not military personnel so they're not trained to fight. And the Syndics, they want to preserve their ships. So they're hoping that the Alliance will just pass by the ships and leave them untouched so that way after the battle they can go back and get them. And Geary's like, well that's not what's gonna happen so I don't know what they was hoping for. And so, you know, they send the Marines into action to go get started on getting the repair ships. While they're doing this, Cassia calls Gary, and he's complaining because he can't observe what's going on with the Marines that are, like, stationed on his ship. And so, Gary's like, I'm the one that gave them the command. Trust me, they're under good command. And Cassia's like, well, why can't I observe? Gary's like, what do you mean, why can't you observe? And so, he, you know, mutes the call, and he talks to Dijon. He's like, are y'all allowed to watch the Marines do their job? And Dejani's like, yeah, that's standard protocol. You know, the senior officers get to watch the Marines basically do their job over their shoulders. And Gary's like, that is insane. That is not how we did things when I was in the fleet a century ago. So he gets on the phone with Carabelli, right? And he's like, listen, it just came to my attention that the senior officers are allowed to watch y'all over y'all shoulders. Here's what we gonna do. I'm trusting you to carry out this plan without them watching over your shoulders. So I need you to prove me right. So that way I can make a case for why they can't do that no more. And Carabali, she's all for this. She's like, oh yes, sir, we gonna do this. We gonna make this work. And so after he gets all this squared away, he tells Cassia to go on about his business. He complaining. Then once Geary shuts him down about that, he tried to get into Geary's personal life. So Geary tell him, go on about your business. This is not what you want. Ryan tells Geary that the fleet, they're kind of like perplexed about the return to Lakota so quickly. They're like, why did we return? They also learned through their interrogation of the few syndics that they did get. Their CEO died. So then the two people who would be next in command, they spent about four hours arguing over who would be the CEO that would head the pursuit force while the other would stay behind with the repair ships. And so Gary's like, why did they spend all that time arguing? Like, shouldn't it be like the next person in command take command. And Ryan basically explains that the Syndic military is run basically kind of like a government. They vote who's going to be the next person in command and they go around politicking to prove why they are the best person to head the fleet. And so she suspects that the four hours wasn't necessarily them arguing back and forth about who's going to take over command, but more so them fleet debating and telling the Syndic fleet, oh, I'm the person who should be in command. This is why I should command a pursuit force. And whoever was going to command that pursuit force was going to be gunning for Geary because they have a lot to prove. This is like their big break to make it into like the higher executive council. And so like once they get up to them higher levels, life is basically made for them. Ryan's like, so whoever is heading that pursuit force, they want to make sure they get you because that's going to be heavy leverage to get them into the executive council. And whoever stayed behind is going to be super pissed because they didn't get the opportunity to pursue you and get all the glory. But now that you're back, they're going to try and take you out too so that they can have a good shot again to that executive council. The Syndic fleet that's been left behind, it's been labeled the casualty flotilla by the ship's artificial intelligence. So they start working on taking out the casualty flotilla and putting their plan into action. And so as Geary is commanding and observing the battle, he notices three ships, Brilliant, Inspire, and Opportune. And he realizes he doesn't know anything about those captains of those ships because they haven't really made themselves distinctive. And as he's watching the battle, he finally understands why most captains aspire to be on battle cruisers because they're the ones getting to see the most action. They're getting to charge at the enemy and do the most and stuff like that. But he also is like, even though that's great and stuff like that, it comes with a huge risk because you got less protection than you would have on a battleship. And so it's these two Syndic battleships that are like heading to protect the repair ships, right? They're basically fighting the like casualty flotilla and their main focus is on getting to these two battleships before they can make it to the repair ships because what they're doing is they're going to protect the repair ships but they're also trying to attack the auxiliaries. They take out this repair ship, they rescue the crews on Audacious and the crew on Audacious is a composite of like all the ships that stayed behind to protect the fleet so they could get away and they didn't think they were going to be rescued so they're super glad to be rescued. Audacious 
itself can't be saved. It's super destroyed. So they have to leave that shit behind. And so Gary and Dejani and Ryan, it's really Ryan who puts this idea in their head. What they're going to do is they're going to overload the power core, right? To explode the shit. Ryan suggests why not using it as a weapon and turning it into a mine. And so Gary and Dejani, they come up with this idea to turn all of the ships the audacious and all of like the syndic ships that they destroy into mines for the pursuit force when they come back they're basically going to come through this minefield and it's going to help them take out the ships right they get on the call with captain tyrosian who is fighting for her life to keep her position they let tyrosian know what their plan is and tyrosian's like oh yeah we can do that that's nothing so they rig the ships to become basically mines and at this point i was sitting here kind of like why are Ryan and Dejani still beefing? Because, you know, while they come up with this plan, they throwing little shots at each other. And I'm like, why are they still beefing? Dejani, you know you can't be with Geary. Ryan, you already have the man, even though your heart is promised to your husband. I'm like, what is y'all beefing for? Like, what is y'all beefing for? Y'all both beefing and neither one of y'all in a relationship with the man. They rig the ships as mines and they're going to use the auxiliaries as bait once again. And Tyrosian, when she realizes this, she's like, are we bait again? And Geary's like, yeah, y'all are bait again. She's like... Okay, sir. I mean, I got a master's degree in business, and there I was his secretary, his office manager, and his computer! They're bait again, and what they're gonna do is they're gonna be looking like they're in a hurry to get the supplies off the repair ships and go. When in reality, that kind of is what's going on, but they gotta make it look like that's what's going on, even though that's what's really going on. And so then the Syndic Pursuit Force, it shows up. And, you know, they got to waste some time before it finally gets to the battle. And as they're waiting, Ryan tells Gary, look, just in case this battle don't go how you want it to go, it's important that Dauntless make it back to the Alliance because Dauntless has the hyperdeck key. Gary's like, what are you trying to say? And she's like, look, you got to make sure this ship get back, even if that means sacrificing the other ships to do it. And Gary's like, this is no ship left behind. Like, we not leaving ships behind. I promised that we was going to make it back as a collective, and that's what we're doing. As the battle is getting ready to start with the Syndic Pursuit Force, Dejani, she's trying to convince Gary to change, you know, the formation so they can be battle ready. And Gary's like, no, we are not changing the formation. I need it to look this way. It looks like they're not prepared for battle. And Gary wants it to look like that. So that way it looks like they're not expecting the Syndic Pursuit Force and look like they got caught off guard when really they ready for them. But he wants them to look like they're caught off guard. So that way the Syndic don't have time to get ready to fight. And so Cassia, he's not happy with this plan. He wants to hold a meeting to have Gary removed from command of the fleet because he's like, I don't like this plan. You know, we should be heading straight for the enemy. What is we doing sitting around acting like we not doing nothing? But nothing comes of it because Gary like Cassia, once again, going about your business because this ain't what you want. Battle finally starts and their plan works. The minefield takes out a huge chunk of the pursuit force. And so during the battle, 3D, who is being led by Warrior, who is now commanded by Commander Suram, Yuri trusts him to actually do his job, but Cassia and Yin, in the battle, basically leave Warrior to fend for themselves. So Warrior, he doing all the work protecting the auxiliaries. Cassia over here, if they come near him, he gonna attack them. But he ain't really doing his job. And Yen all the way over here just running and hiding. And Dejani and Gary are like, Okay, right? well, where were you when you were right? was getting jumped? Where was you? They're like, these two ain't doing their job. Gary's like, as soon as this battle is over, them two are out. I am sick of it. And what ends up happening is... Warrior end up getting destroyed because they doing all the work to protect the auxiliaries. They're getting jumped and the people who's supposed to be helping them in the fight is over here acting scary. So they flop. Majestic is lost. And so if you don't remember, Majestic is the ship that was commanded by Fariza. So Majestic ends up getting destroyed too. So it's assumed Fariza is killed in the battle. So we don't got to worry about her. You know, Majestic at least was doing a little bit of something. Majestic at least put some effort in, but they got jumped. They got killed too. But it bought them time for the other people in the fleet to come rescue them because they were so busy focusing on them ships that the Syndics didn't have time to go attack the auxiliary. It bought them time to come in and take out the Syndics that were attacking over there near the auxiliary. Yen and Cassia, after the battle, they get fired. Warrior is badly damaged. They can't communicate with anybody. They can't see what's going on. All they can see is some explosions from space, but they can't see because their power is off and their power core is super unstable. So what ends up happening is Suram, you know, basically lets the fleet know, look, I'm trying to get my crew off the ship, but if it goes down, it was nice serving with y'all. They did try to rescue the crew on Warrior, but they couldn't get to them in time. So the ship explodes. Today is October 29th. I'm on chapter five of Valiant. I don't really know how I feel about this book so far. We just did the big battle in Lakota and they won, but like the battle was kind of just meh. 
to be honest, compared to the first battle in Lakota. But the only things that were interesting, Yen and Kazuya are about to be fired because they absolutely sucked in this battle. They did not do what they were supposed to do. And poor Warrior got killed. Majestic got killed too. Majestic is one of 3D. 3D was an absolute flop in this battle. And I am just like, how do you flop this badly? And by 3D, I mean the third battleship division. Because there's a third battleship division and then there's another third division. This is the third battleship division. And I call them 3D because they're a bunch of flops. And I got tired of writing third division in my notes. They flopped so hard. It makes no sense. I was hoping they talked all that stuff. But when it came down to an actual battle, they'd prove why they were made commanders even if they are in the worst division. But nope, they absolutely flopped. Never sad. They make sure the descendants can't salvage anything. They get what they need to get. And then Gary goes and takes some arrest. And he gets woken up by the syndics destroying the hypernet. Gary and Dejani, they like, do they know what they doing? Like, do they understand what's gonna come? of destroying this hypernet. And so they're like, either they know what's gonna happen and they're doing it anyway because they're like, it's worth the sacrifice or the ship captains don't know what's gonna happen from destroying that hypernet and they just been ordered to do it. And the upper level government didn't tell them what was gonna happen. But either way, we gotta get as far out of range as we can get from this hypernet. And so that's what they do. And Dejani suggests warning the civilians. And so they warn the civilians. They like, look, y'all, y'all people is taking out the hypernet. I suggest y'all take cover because it's going to be really bad. And they prepare just in case that they don't make it through. They prepare to die. They start saying their goodbyes and stuff. The hypernet goes down and, you know, they got to wait like a little bit because space. They managed to get far away enough to survive, but it was still a huge energy output. Messed up the atmosphere heavily of Lakota 3. Geary, he wishes that they could rescue the people that was down there. Dejani, she's flipping out because she's like, oh my gosh, we gotta make sure there was no alliance people down there. Like, this is terrible. But Geary's like, look, we've been in this situation before when I was in the fleet of century, but we couldn't rescue the people on the planet. There's really nothing we can do for them. And so Dejani, she's pissed off, but she wanted to make sure that there's no alliance people left behind on the planet. But they can't do nothing about it, so they end up having to leave. And so because of this, the secret about the hypernets and what they can do is out. Dejani is pissed because she's like, she can't believe the government of the syndicate set their people up like that. And Gary's depressed because, you know, it was a huge loss of life in the battle. And then you got the hypernet being destroyed. And, you know, it's suspected that Fariza died. It's suspected that Captain Caressa's died. Falco definitely died. He actually chose to go down with his ship. You know, they tried to evacuate him, but... He was like, no, I'm going down with the ship. And, you know, Gary's kind of depressed about that because he's like, dang, you know, I wish I could have got Falco some help. You know, I wish I could have did a little bit more for him. You know, he was struggling. You know, he's just depressed by the whole situation. And so Ryan, she's talking with him. She's letting him know all this information. And, you know, she's basically trying to find a silver lining in it. And Gary's like, there is no silver lining. We lost all these people. People is dying. Ryan's like, you know, I lost some people too. I lost my spies that was on them ships. And Gary's like, oh yeah, you did. Shoot, I'm sorry. And so Ryan asks Gary, what are you fighting for? And Gary's like, uh, to get back to the Alliance. And Ryan's like, no. Whenever somebody's fighting hard for something, there's a personal motivator, and I know it's not me. You probably don't know it yet, but you have another motivator. And Gary's like, I don't know what you're talking about. She's talking about Dejani. He hasn't accepted that he has feelings for Dejani yet. And so then after they have that conversation, they discuss where they're going next. They're going to Bronwyn, then they're going to Windig, then they're going to Cavallos. And then Ryan is like, okay, so look. You know, you got this alien theory, right? I suggest you bring in your trusted people in on it. Because, you know, you're going to need some allies. Because I suspect that your opponents in the fleet, after having pulled this off against the Syndic Pursuit Force, I think they're going to try and come for you. And so I suspect that you get ready. And I suggest that you kill Cassia. And yet I suggest you have them shot <laughs> for not fighting. So they get into the meeting, right? Everybody agrees with Ryan. You need to have Cassia and Yen shot for not fighting. And Gary, he doesn't want to do that. He instead has them transferred to Captain Badiah's ship. But Cassia's like, nope, I don't want to be demoted. I want to be shot. But I want to go out with honor, even though he ain't do nothing in the fight. And so Captain Keela, she's the captain of one of them ships, Brilliant Inspire or Opportunity. She opposes Gary's decision to not have them shot the most. She's like, look, the fleet regulations say that you can have them shot for not fighting. And Gary's like, I know what the regulations say. I was there when they wrote them. I know why they were written. And I know what constitutes them being carried out. And I say this does not constitute them being carried out. And so that shuts her up because it's like, oh, shoot. You was there when it was written. 
And basically the reason why he wants them to live is because he wants them to live with the guilt of what they chose to do. But Cassie is like, nope, shoot me down. I don't care. Shoot me down. Yen, she don't want to be shot down. She's like, I was just taking orders. I ain't have nothing to do with this. And Gary's like, well, you wasn't taking my orders. So whose orders was you taking? And she was like, somebody who's more competent than you. And Duellus is like, well, who was it then? And she's like, Captain Numos. And so they're like, oh, well, you was taking orders from Captain Numos and he not supposed to be giving orders. So that's another reason for you to at least be demoted from your command. She in despair. She trying to get out of it. And so the reason why she was taking orders from Numos is because they're scared that Geary is going to take over as a dictator and have Dejani basically as his ruling partner. They're like, shoot, if we gonna have a dictator, we might as well have one that's at least competent. They're demoted. Cassie gets his wish to be shot down by a firing squad and Yen is arrested until they can get back to Lion's Fleet where she can be tried for what she did. He lets everybody know what the next objective is and he gets resistant from Armis and Keela who are the captains of, I believe, Brilliant and Inspire. They're like, no, we need to use a hypernet to get home or destroy them and use them as weapons. And Gary's like, we are not doing that. And he explains why they are not doing that. And they come up with the idea to release the video of the Syndics destroying the hypernet because they're the only ones with the video. So they're like, we need to release this video to prove that we didn't do this and to showcase that it was the Syndics who did it because whatever excuse they try to give for why it happened, this video proves that they did it and that if they didn't know about it, then they didn't do their research. And if they did know about it, then they put their people in harm's danger. It's going to weaken the people's trust in the Syndicate government. Christine is like, oh, I can take this data that we have from these two hypernet collapses and I can work out some stuff to figure out how to like safeguard their hypernets. So that way, when they get back to Alliance Space, they can safeguard their hypernets and make sure that the syndicates can't use them against them. And so then after the meeting, Dejani and Geary talk. She encourages him. She's like, you're doing great. You're doing wonderful. They both have crushes on each other, but they don't want to act on it because they're still in the fleet. But you know who survived the battle? Lieutenant Riva. Dejani's ex-boyfriend who cheated on her, he survived. You know, Geary tells Dejani, oh, hey, Reva survived. Dejani's like, and that's great, good for him. Hopefully he can find him a nice little young thing over there like he did when we were supposed to be dating. They done for good. And I'm just like, you might as well have just killed him off in the battle because what was the point of bringing Reva back? He brought nothing to the story. He came back, he posed little threat to this love triangle. And then basically he just got sidelined through the rest of the story. You have nothing to do with him. He's not offering nothing. You don't have nothing to do with him. You might as well just kill him off in the battle. She don't care about Reva. She's jealous of Ryan because Ryan didn't caught feelings. And so then after that, he goes to his room and Ryan and him argue about some stuff. They talk about how the audacious survival list is available because Dejani called him to let him know, oh, hey, the list is available. And Gary's like, okay, thank you. And then Ryan's like, oh, you see that? You see that? This is what I'm talking about. You got feelings for her. She got feelings for you. They get to arguing about it. And Ryan's like, look, you like her over me. And you know what? That bothers me because I done caught feelings for you. And I ain't going to be no second choice. This is over. Go ahead and change your security settings to where I can't come in at will anymore. And from now on, I'm just going to be your advisor. And so then Gary goes over the list of the survivors from Audacious. And he noticed there's this commander named Commander Savos, who's basically the highest level of command amongst the survivors. He gets on a call with him. And Commander Savos looked like he'd been through it. He basically lets Gary know what happened while they were, you know, being held captive and how the syndics basically abandoned them because they were like, look, is Gary who he says he is? And he was like, yeah. And they were like, is he really letting people like syndics live and stuff like that? And Savos was like, yeah. And so they're like, okay, you know, forget this job. Let's go. They basically let the survivors live instead of doing what they were supposed to do. And Gary is like, he decides that after they get to where they're going, He's going to promote Savos to Captain Orion, but he wants to wait until they get to Bronwyn to, you know, see how Savos feels about it and if he's going to get better because he look like crap. He look like he been through it. Kazi and Yen, they're being put on Badia's ship and as they're on their way to the ship, the shuttle that they're on explodes. Oh, girl. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, what just happened? It's said to be an accident, but Ryan's like, that wasn't no accident. I think your opponents had them shut up so that they wouldn't talk and reveal what was going on. She suggests it's an inside job and yeah, he needs to start getting prepared because they starting to act. And Gary realizes that his opponents in the fleet, they not gonna stop at nothing, including taking out fellow Alliance members. You think you know people and then they surprise you. October 30th, right? And I'm up to chapter seven in this book. So remember how I told y'all 3D flopped in the battle? Um, Farisa, Falco, and Carestis might be dead. Falco is for sure dead. He ensured that he died on the ship going down with Warrior. You get into this meeting and 
everybody wants Kazuya and Yen shot down because that's the regulation. But Giri's like, no, I'm gonna leave him alive. But Kazuya's like, no, shoot me down. And Yen's like, I was just following Numo's orders. She threw Numo's under the bus, right? They both get what they want. Kazuya is gonna get death by firing squad and Yen is going to be put in prison until they get back to the Alliance, right? Why both of them die in a freak accident? We're gonna have to see how the second half goes. Right now, it's doing slightly better than Courageous did, but only slightly. So it could still end up like a 3.75 or a 3.5, but right now, I'm willing to at least give a score on par with Courageous, which is 3.75. So then Geary confronts Numos. Numos being Numos, Geary can't get nothing out of him. Ryan's like, I don't even know why you even thought about doing that because you wasn't gonna get nothing. You knew you weren't gonna get nothing. And so then Ryan suggests having him, you know, interrogated. But he's like, I don't want to fan the dictatorship flames. And then he questions her on why she didn't let him know about his opponents fearing that he would become a dictator. And she's like, it's not that they don't want a dictator. They can't control you. They want somebody they can control. And Numos is easily controllable. And she says the reason why is because the military has lost faith in the Alliance government, which is evident because they don't really like Ryan and they don't trust her. And Gary is basically, you know, become the hero that can save them from the government. And Gary's like, I'm not trying to overthrow the Alliance government. I'm just trying to get this fleet back home, going about my business. And Ryan's like, if you really think that's what's going to happen, that's not what's going to happen. And so as they're getting ready to jump, they get a transmission from Lakota 3, who basically saying, we down here struggling, somebody help. They can't provide help because they don't have the resources, but they're like, look, we're going to go to another star system. We're going to let them know y'all down here struggling and we're going to let them know that y'all need help. And so then he holds a meeting with his trusted captains, which are Christina, Duelo, Tulev, Dejani, and Ryan is also there. Updates them on his alien theory. They're shook. They're like, aliens? What do you mean, aliens? We was not prepared to deal with no aliens. What are you talking about? And, do you know, they're trying to figure out what the aliens want. And Duelos is like, trying to figure out what they want is useless because they don't think like us. And Christina jumps in there and she adds, if they're used to dealing with the syndicates and the syndicates are their model for what humans are like it's no wonder they started a war to try and take us out we know how the syndicates get down and Yuri's like you know what you're right they theorize that the syndicate started the war to keep from getting jumped by basically the alliance and the aliens. And so then Ryan brings up the start of the war, which Geary was there for, but he wasn't there for because he went in the crowd sleep at Grindel and that was one of the first big battles. So he didn't know what happened after that. And so Ryan brings up how like during the first major battles, critical points of the Alliance were not attacked. They attacked like non-critical points. And so she theorizes that the reason why is because the syndicates were expecting help from the aliens. She suspects that the aliens made a deal with the syndicates that they would attack together. But then when it came time to do it, the aliens left the syndicates out to dry and basically went on about their business and so now they've started this war and the syndicates have been double crossed and instead of admitting that they've been double crossed they fight in this war to basically be like we started this war we gonna win even though they don't have the help that they expected that they was gonna have and they losing terribly but what's not clear is if the alliance government knows about the aliens and ryan says she doesn't know much because the top levels of the alliance they don't let nothing out they don't let nothing slip but she does says if they do know they're not gonna say nothing because if they find out that aliens started this war it's gonna start an even bigger war because then it's gonna be them fighting the syndicate them fighting the aliens and she like we ain't got time for this it comes up that they believe gary is getting divine inspiration and gary's like i am not getting divine inspiration where is y'all getting that from and they're like well Every choice you've made so far has gotten us closer and closer to our goal. You haven't messed up. You haven't slipped. You've pulled off amazing feats that none of us could have pulled off. What do you want us to think? And he's like, I am not getting divine inspiration. Y'all need to let that go. That's a group are taken out from the freezer. We keep it fresh frozen. Fresh frozen? Yes, sir. There's no such thing. See, the fresh one is frozen. So today is October 30th, right? And I'm reading chapter seven. I'm in the middle of it. But I had to stop to come and say, I really do not trust Captain Dwellers. Gary is updating his trusted captains, which is Dwellers, Tulev, and Cressida on the whole alien theory and what he's learned. I don't trust Dwellers because Ryan says that she believes there's a spy on the ship that's reporting to the aliens because how else would they have known that the fleet was in Lakota? I've been saying since the first book, I don't trust Captain Dwellers. Like he came in too easily wanting to be Gary's friend. They attached themselves to somebody's side too quickly and like they just be all up under somebody. That's what Captain Dwellers seemed like to me. Now I haven't trusted him this whole time. I feel like he might be the spy for the aliens. Why? I don't know. But I think it's him. And so they get to Bronwyn 
And the syndic presence there is larger than they expected, but it's not a military presence. Ryan says that those are pirates who are operating illegally to get supplies. They shouldn't pose no threat because that's going to mess up their money. And Gary's like, well, can we get them to work with us? And Ryan's like, you got some money? Not enough to persuade them to help us. And she's like, well, then you can't get no help. Nothing really happens in that system aside from Gary and Dejani trying to disprove that they're in a romantic relationship and they got feelings for each other. And so Gary finally learns a little bit more about his grandniece who is commander of the Dreadnought ship. And so Dejani comforts him on like the losses in the battle. And then he goes to his room and he finds Ryan who admits that she got feelings. And so then two days later, he has a conversation with Captain Duelos. They just talk about a whole bunch of stuff about business and pleasure and Gary's life and stuff like that. And so Duelo says that he suspects that the opponents want to replace Gary with somebody who is not only easily influenced, but will appeal to everybody, including the people who support Gary. And so that's why he's like, it could be, you know, Caligo or Killa, but they're not really the best options. But, you know, they're good examples of somebody who, like, appeals to everybody. And he also tells them that commanders at higher level of commands are more valuable politically because what they're talking about is Kayla and how like she really hasn't distinguished herself all that much and Dwellers is like that's because she's better as like a political person than as a commander like she's a competent commander but she's amazing politically and so she's probably trying to amass a good political advantage because he's like her doing what she's doing is not in her character she's typically the type of person to kiss up to people but Gary's like well she don't seem like she's kissing up to me she's opposing me and so then during the night Gary gets a message from Commander Gaius it's a coded message that basically lets him know that there are worms in the system they check it out and basically the worms were meant to have when they jumped from Bronwyn to Windig what was gonna happen was the ship systems were gonna fail and they're gonna be stuck in jump space. Geary calls an emergency meeting with his trusted captains and they basically report they have worms in their systems too. And so Ryan, she joins the meeting and she's like, y'all need to tell everybody immediately because what they're counting on is y'all holding it as a secret. And if y'all hold it as a secret, it's going to make it look like y'all don't trust them. It's going to make it look like one of y'all could have did it. But if y'all let them know and get ahead of it, they're not going to be able to use it against y'all. And so that's what they do. Dauntless and then the ships that Dwellos and I think Cressida commanded would have been left in jump space while everybody else would have arrived in Windig but wouldn't have been able to use their ships. And so it's suspected that what would have went down, they would have, you know, basically elected a new commander to take control of the fleet because Geary's gone. The Johnny is like, my room settings have been tampered with. The tampering has basically made it to where Ryan has access to Dejani and Geary's rooms at will. And so Dejani is like, I don't know who did it, but it could be Ryan. Geary's like, I don't think she did it because why would she do it? But he goes and confronts Ryan anyway, and he's like, look, somebody's tampered with the settings to give you access to our room. I want to interrogate you to clear you. And Ryan's like, interrogate me? For what? And he's like, I think this person is trying to frame you. She's like, it could be Dejani. And Gary's like, Dejani, if she had an issue with you, she would just come straight to you and tell you, and you know that. And she's like, you right. And so she agrees to the interrogation to clear her name. She passes, but she's super upset and annoyed about it. They have a meeting, and Gary tells everybody what's going on. He says Ryan doesn't have no involvement because she just took the interrogation with trusted interrogators at the highest level of interrogation possible and she passed. Everybody is shocked. They're appalled. They're like, who would do this? And so then after the meeting, Captain Moultrie stays behind and he's like, look, sir, I think I know how this worm got around. You know, there's a black market on the fleet's internet system. I'm going to let you know about it. I'm going to give you all you need to access it, but don't let it come back to me. And so Gary checks it out. And it's some stuff on there that disturbs him. He's like, oh, heck no. Nah. How can we get this shut down? And Dejani's like, yeah, we need to get this shut down. And basically, the person in charge of securing the internet is like, look, y'all need to leave this up. Because what's going to happen is if we take this down, they're going to set up another black market internet. And it's going to take us a while to be able to find it and identify it, observing it again. But if y'all leave this one up, they're not going to be able to suspect. They're going to use it again to try and sabotage. And we'll be able to catch it this time. And so Gary and Dejani reluctantly leave up the black market internet. Dejani's like, well, whoever gave this to you, you need to get them, you know, evaluated. And Gary's like, uh, that's exactly what I'm about to do. So he sets up an evaluation for Moultrie because he's like, why would you like stuff like this? They'll be able to monitor the black market internet and they'll be able to monitor if anything comes through it. But they won't be able to figure out who sent it because it's anonymous. Like it's set up so that it doesn't trace back to whoever uploaded the stuff. 
They jump to Windig is successful. So today is November 2nd. I'm still reading Valiant and I just want to say that if Valiant gets a four, it'll be 100% because of chapter eight. Like it was already doing well enough to at least get a 3.75, but chapter eight will be possibly the sole reason that it gets a four from me because chapter eight was good. It was great. It's probably the best chapter in this book. It delivered on the political intrigue. It delivered on the drama. It delivered on good writing. It delivered everything I needed. I have three more chapters, so I finished. But honestly, this book is doing better with me than Courageous did. And I think that says something because this book has provided original ideas. It's provided a good, interesting plot. Courageous was kind of just, it was meh. It was May, but this book, this book is doing well. So hopefully it continues doing well for the last three chapters and it gets itself a four, but it's at least getting a 3.75. I know that much. Wendig is a ghost system. Like there is only a few inhabitants left that were like left behind from a long time ago. Gary wants to rescue the people down there because they get this transmission. That's like anybody that's listening, we are on our last leg. Please help us, please save us. Gary's like, I want to rescue them. Dejani's like, why? And Gary's like, because it's the right thing to do. And I can just feel it in my gut that it's the right thing to do. So they end up rescuing the people and he lets them know, hey, listen, it's us, the Alliance fleet. We're going to rescue y'all. We need y'all to make sure y'all ready to go. But they're like, why would you rescue us? Y'all are alliance. Is the war over? Gary's like, the war is not over. But look, we passing through here. We might be y'all only hope. So y'all need to come on. They, they agree and they get rescued. While they're doing this, another worm was set up. When they went to execute the plan, what was going to happen was two of the ships, Dwellos' ship and another ship, was going to start firing on the people on the planet. But they caught it in time. And so I'm suspecting that Dwellos is the head of the opposition. I'm just gonna be honest. I've been suspecting him since the first book because something about him is not trustworthy to me. And the fact that his ship has been involved in both sabotage events, either he's the saboteur and he's trying to make it look like he's being sabotaged as well to cover his tracks or they just really don't like him. I think he's somehow involved in the opposition because something about him is just not trustworthy to me. They pick up the Syndic survivors. Savos ends up taking over Orion and they jump to Cavallos. And so while they're getting ready to jump to Cavallos, they bring in the people on the ship, the mayor of the planet. He's like, listen, I don't know why you're doing this, but thank you. Gary's like, because it's the right thing to do. There might not be anybody else coming through here and we just couldn't leave y'all behind like that. And so, you know, his wife and son, they're wary, but Dejani's like, listen, everybody on the ship is gonna be treated with respect. They're gonna be treated well, as long as y'all don't act the fool. This is y'all sleeping arrangements. This is what y'all gonna eat. This is how things are going to go. As long as y'all act like y'all got some sense, y'all be treated well. So then they jump to Cavallos, right? And in Cavallos, Giri tries to drop the Syndic people off on like the planet there. It's still got a, a sizable population enough that they'll be okay there for a good little bit. But the lady who's in charge, the Syndic CEO of the planet, she's like, look, please do not drop them people off here. If you drop them off, we're going to have to attack y'all. And Giri's like, look, we got y'all people on here. If you attack us... You might hit your people. We don't want that. We just want to drop the people off and go. So they go back and forth about it a little bit, but then he's able to convince her that they really just want to drop the people off and go. And so she's like, okay, look, drop the people off and go on about your business. So they drop the people off. The people, they thank them for, you know, being so hospitable and saving them and stuff like that. And they go on about their business. And so after they drop off the syndics, you know, Dejani's like, it's harder when they're just faceless ships that you're just trying to fight. But when you start seeing them as actual people, now it's harder to fight them. She's basically like, can we like basically like, you know, fight the people who are in the military who volunteered to fight and um, leave the civilians alone? And Gary's like, that's what I've been trying to do this whole time. While they're talking about this, you know, it pivots to the talk about the dictatorship. And Dejani says that she has been encouraged to offer herself to Gary. And Gary's like, don't you dare do that. And Dejani like, I, I wasn't going to do that no ways. As they are on their way to the gate, some syndics come out of the gate. We're just trying to leave. Today is November 4th and I'm almost done with Valiant. I'm on chapter 10. But I just need to say, I think Captain Duelos is the traitor. I mean, I haven't trusted him since the beginning of the series, but somebody is trying to sabotage the ships and basically trying to get it to where Gary is removed from command, right? And both times, Duelos' ship has been one of the ships targeted. All of the ships have been targeted, but his specifically have been targeted to be destroyed. And I'm just like, I don't think that's a coincidence. I'm like, either the saboteur is really stupid to keep targeting the same people 
or the saboteur is targeting themselves. My theory is because in the last book in Courageous, Gary said he doesn't know if the aliens are against them or for them. In this book, they're kind of theorizing that the aliens are just trying to keep the war going for whatever reason. But I suspect that Duelos is the spy for the aliens. He's the one having, you know, all these things thrown in Geary's path because he knows that Geary's going to succeed and overcome them. But also just, he's been acting really weird in this book from my point of view. It just could be that I don't trust him, but he has been acting very weird from my point of view. I think he's the traitor. And also, this Ryan Dejani Geary love triangle is so stupid. And they brought in Lieutenant Reva for no reason because he was here for all of two seconds and he gave nothing to the storyline. And we're beefing for what? That's what I feel as we come to the close on book four of this series. I feel like Dwellus is the traitor and I feel like this love triangle is stupid. The Syndic CEO of the planet, she contacts Gary and she's like, listen, the mayor was her younger brother. And she's like, I didn't know my younger brother was still alive. I thought he was dead. Because what ended up happening was the mayor tells Gary what ended up happening was they worked for like Syndic corporations. And so all the corporate heads got evacuated out once you know the hypernets came around and they were told that ships would be coming for them but the ships never came so they were just there making do with what they had and so the syndic ceo lady she's like i thought my brother was gone i thought he was dead had i known that he was over in the next star system fighting for his life and nobody told me nothing i didn't know nothing about him thank you for saving him and so i'm gonna repay my dad basically what's gonna happen is y'all finna be jumped by this fleet that's coming in that they just saw coming in they finna try and fight y'all i have no worries that y'all are gonna lose i know y'all are gonna win but listen i'm tired of this useless war we all tired of the war it's so draining after he talks with the ceo ryan talks to him and she says that she came along basically Basically to keep Admiral Block from trying to become a dictator. And so she was like, if it came down to it, I was going to kill him and I was going to handle my business. And you know what it was, was what it was, but at least he was dead. We avoided dictatorship. And so that's when she says everything about staying at his side to be like an ally for when they get back to the Alliance. You're going to get to Alliance space. They're going to want a lot from you and you're going to want me by your side because I'm going to be the only one who's going to be able to help you navigate through the politics of the Alliance. And so then Cressida and Dejani reveal that they've discovered how the aliens have been tracking them. And so basically, they don't know exactly what's going on, but they have some program attached to their communications. And so Cressida's like, I don't know if I can like counter their program, but I can't find a way to disrupt it. They suspect it could have been planted through the hypernet keys and like hypernet keys are on every ship for them to jump through hypernets. And so she suspects if the hypernets are alien technology, then this program is through the hypernet keys. And so they need to check out the hypernet keys. And so she's like, I can create an antiviral program that can disrupt what they're doing, but it won't be able to like completely stop it. And so they get into the battle and, you know, Geary, he messes up his first formation and takes some losses. And that kind of rattles him for a little bit. And Ryan's like, I hope you get it together. Mm -hmm. I hope you do so. Oh, girl. So he ends up getting it together and they end up winning the battle. But during the battle, brilliant and inspired break formation and opportune is in the division with them follows behind them and gets themselves killed inspired and brilliant survives but is badly damaged so then after the battle some of the ships are badly damaged they gotta like leave some of the ships behind but they manage to capture the syndic ceo's second in command gary goes down there to interrogate him and talk to him and they basically learned that the Syndic know something about the alien. This specific CEO doesn't know a lot. They're tired of the war and their government is not telling them everything. Gary reveals some stuff that he's learned that the CEO didn't know. Ryan is like, oh, if you appeal to his self-interest, we can use this to like help demoralize the Syndicate. And so that's what they do. He's like, oh, if I can benefit personally from this, then yeah, I'll help. He knows something about the hypernet destruction because he was at first hypernet that was destroyed. It's not very clear like what is and what isn't known about it because the syndicate upper level people was not listening to them. And he also says that their executive council will never negotiate with the Alliance as long as there's a chance to stop Gary from making it back. But he also says that once they make it back, the executive council 
is probably going to be ousted because they failed. Either be replaced with new people that's going to want to negotiate into the war or the people's going to overthrow them and end the war themselves because after that, it's going to be no reason. And so after getting ready to enter jump space, Gary researches about his captains, his family. He learns that a lot of Garys were in commanding positions and a lot of them died in battle. And he also learns some stuff about Dejani's family, like how she had a younger brother that died and stuff like that. And that he feels like that's why she, the way she was with the people that they rescued. And, you know, Dejani comes and they talk and she comforts him about, you know, his family and they admit their feelings. And basically she's like, you know, I've lost my honor. And Gary's like, you haven't lost your honor. And she's like, yes, I have because I've fallen in love with you and I can't do this because you're my fleet commander. And so basically what they do is they admit their feelings and Dejani's like, you can hold on to my honor because I've freely given it to you as long as I have your promise that after this war ends, be together. Because what Gary plans to do is after the war ends, he's going to end the war and then he's going to resign from the fleet. So that way they can be together and live happily ever after. And that's how the book ends. Today is November 4th. I finished Valiant like earlier today. I gave it a four. It was a good, interesting book. As far as the storyline, you know, it was interesting. It was good. Dajani and Gary. I guess you could say it's an end to the love triangle, I guess, because they've all but promised themselves to each other. I guess that's how their relationship is going to go. So I'm excited to start the next book, Relentless. I'm excited to see how this is going to go. You know, like the alien stuff. Now they're theorizing that there may be more than one type of alien out there and the aliens are fighting with other aliens and they started this war with the humans to keep the humans occupied while they fought their own war. It's a lot going on. I'm excited for them to get back to Alliance space and just see how everything is going to go there. Because, you know, now I'm intrigued. And so I ended up giving this book a four. I enjoyed this book a lot more than Courageous. Because this book had a lot more original material. It had good, interesting storylines. Whereas Courageous was like repeated scene after repeated scene. There's a lot of repeated situations. But this, I really enjoyed this book. And I gave it a four. And I really liked it. I'm interested to see if I'm right about Duelos. I don't know if I'm really all that interested in this love triangle. Because it's really not a love triangle no more. At this point, it's just... Geary likes Dejani, Dejani likes Geary, and Ryan's over here mad because she ain't got a man now at all. But thank you for tuning into this video. If you liked it, go ahead, give it a like, a comment, and be sure to subscribe to my channel for more amazing content. And be sure to check out my other videos that I've done. And also make sure that you go check out my books that I've written because I don't just read them, I write them too. And, you know, go check them out if you're looking for something amazing to read. Thoroughly suggest the Creek series. But other than that, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.